Do you ever take cold showers? Every day. Yeah. Stop it. No way. There's no downside, right? Worst case, I'm a little bit cold. And yeah, I, I'm very much a, a Wim Hof uh, bandwagon kind of guy. Velas, thanks so much for joining me today. We are thrilled to have you on the podcast. It's a pleasure, Drew. Thanks for having me. I think I probably know your your background and story maybe a little bit more than our listeners do. So maybe if you could just give us a quick glimpse of your professional career, maybe even starting after your time as a tennis player at Notre Dame. Yeah, for sure. So right out of school, I went to Ernst & Young in Chicago, and I was working as a uh, financial consultant there and sort of the typical consulting lifestyle, Monday through Thursday on the road and, uh, you know, long hours and all that. And it was fun for a year or two, but I sort of saw the learning curve uh, sloping off a bit. So I started to think about the next thing and was lucky enough to have gotten to know the Notre Dame endowment team when I was still at school. So uh, there are a couple of tennis players there and I played tennis in school and it was just sort of a, a natural connection. So I reached out to those guys and more just to pick their brains, but um, bamboozled them, I guess, to letting me join their team. And I was there for a couple of years too. And just amazing guys, amazing platform, amazing place to learn. And the one of the key lessons for me drew through that was I, I felt like that investing style was a little bit abstract. I got really excited when we would meet with entrepreneurs and CEOs and management teams and see what they were actually doing on the ground. And I sort of wanted to be part of that to, to you know, boots on the ground, help execute, help build a team. And that's sort of where I've been these last couple of years. I'm uh, now at Clean Air in Southern California, an aerospace manufacturer. And uh, loving it out here and kind of get to scratch that itch and see what it's like to lead a pretty sizable team and uh, help with strategy and kind of thinking about long-term vision. So really high level overview, but that's, that's kind of my professional life so far. It's interesting. You mentioned the investment office. I spent some time with those guys actually during my yeah. time at Notre Dame and they're brilliant guys. Uh, Paul Buser, Rick Berman, and, and all those guys are just fascinating guys. But I think one thing I appreciated about those guys and they, kind of invoked in me was this idea of being a lifelong learner. And I know certainly you're very much end of all into all that was learning kind of after you transitioned out of tennis, where you kind of geared your competitive spirit. Was it kind of like, I'm going to go after this, this learning thing now. What, what was that transition for you? It was absolutely after tennis drew. So I gave everything I had to, to tennis, right? It was nights, it was weekends, it was all the time. And I just didn't have much energy to put towards anything else. But after I graduated, I sort of thought that I needed something to replace tennis, right? You can't just take four hours a day and replace it with nothing. Something will fill that time. And I sat down and I actually remember in my little apartment in Chicago, writing all these things down by hand, but really thinking through it. And what did I want out of life when I was 80? What would I look back on and, and never regret? And I sort of came up with this framework that learning, reading, traveling, meeting interesting people would, I would never regret that, or at least I, I never thought I would. And that became my new sport. That was my new tennis. So instead of going to the courts after work, I would go to the library or just to my apartment, but spend a couple hours reading. And that's sort of where this all sparked. I didn't really know where it was going to take me. And it's sort of easy to look back and connect the dots. But at the time, it was just a little experiment trying new things. And um, yeah, I really kindled this, this curiosity, this lifelong learning. And it's only been seven years, but I think a lot's happened in seven years. And it's been an incredible journey. And you know, we'll dig into some of those projects and maybe where this lifelong learning might be taking me soon. Does the, does the lifelong learning, does that require, I'm sure it requires discipline, just like athletics does, but was there ever a day when you're like, I don't want to go to the library? So tennis definitely helped. It set a regimen, it helped build routine, it helped build discipline. And the thing that's really different, at least for me, Drew, was all of this was self-imposed, right? There are no grades, there's no professor, nobody was telling me I had to read this thing or do this thing. So it was all my own curiosity. So no is is really the answer like yeah there were days i was tired and there were days i didn't go because you know a friend was in town or whatever but for the most part that was sort of the the routine and i got to choose everything and um you know that's what kind of makes it feel effortless is is nobody's imposing anything on me it's all self-driven and i think that's what makes it so fun for me i think when you move out of a, a phase in your life and you, 
you get a little bit of downtime, you get time to think. You it's that saying, right? Hindsight's always better than foresight, or maybe it's the other way around. But after you finished playing tennis and you went on this stamp of of doing all this learning and going to the library, was there anything? I think you actually wrote an essay on it of what you wish you had been given or known as a student athlete. What were those things that maybe you wish you had or knew, knew during your time as a student athlete that you were starting to understand as a young business professional? So there are a couple of things, Drew, but one is that the skills you build as an athlete, it's applicable no matter what you do after your athletics, right? So we talked a little bit about the discipline and the habits that come from daily practice and trying to pursue something to a high level. The same grit, the same perseverance, the same discipline, it applies no matter what you do. And it was a journey for me and this essay that we'll share, it talks a little bit about this in in a little bit more depth, but it's on you then to figure out how these skills help you in the next phase of your life. Whether you go to work for a company, you start your own thing, you become a coach, whatever it is, but your job is sort of to figure out how do these skills I've honed for the last 10, 12, 15 years translate into the next phase of my life. So that's one key thing. Another is just the role of mentors and coaches. And with athletics, that's sort of in-baked, right? There are maybe some people in some sports where a coach is not as big of a you know, a role in your development, but for tennis and for football, it, it certainly is. And you need the same thing in life, right? You need mentors. You need people to look up to, people who can coach you and guide you. And it's a little bit harder in the work world. It's a little bit less structured, right? You kind of have to go out of your way to find these people, but it's really worth trying to do it. And it, it could be someone you work with. It could be a family member. It could be a friend, whatever it is, but having those people who are experts or experienced or just people you admire for whatever reason, having them in your life to go to that you trust that, you know, they have your back. It's humongous. And that's kind of a, another lesson from sport that I wish I had picked up a little bit younger. Um, and it, yeah, it's something I try to share with other tennis players, other athletes to try to structure their life around that to try to find that. I think one of the most fascinating parts is that you actually took the time to write that down in an essay. And I think writing has become a huge part of your life. And I, I was digging through your thing, your personal blog, the rabbit hole, which I, I want to ask you how that even came about, but you can find that at, at Blas, B-A-B-L-A-S.com. And dude, you've written over like 600 book summaries, essays, uh, reviews, including some of my favorite of the art of learning and it's your ship. Uh, how the heck did this start? Dude, this thing is like massive. It's like this massive library in and of itself. And I think anybody who looks at it, it's like, that's intimidating to like, even think about accumulating that type of, of knowledge or that type of reading. How, how did that even come about? How did that start? It all starts pretty small, Drew. So I, there, there was no grand plan or anything like that. And I, part of this process, like you said, actually just writing it down is so helpful and it doesn't need to be this beautiful master plan. It's just really taking the time to think through it yourself and what does success look like for you? Um, and it's hard. It, it's really hard because you have to face some demons and some uncertainties and a bunch of insecurities. Uh, at least I did. But part of that process, Drew, I knew that I wasn't, I'm not smart enough to remember everything I read. So why not take notes along the way and in 5, 10, 20 years, instead of having to reread a book, I can just go back to my notes. So in the long term, I'm actually saving myself a whole bunch of time. But that's where it started, just these books that I was reading, taking notes on it, and I was just saving it for myself. And then some friends, some family, they said, look, might as well share it. You're doing all this work anyway. Just start a little website, put it up there, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but at least share it with people. And I'm so glad they pushed me to do that because it's only been seven years, but you know, um, almost a hundred books a year since then. And that sounds crazy to say that out loud, but it's never felt that crazy. Again, it's all been self, my, my own curiosity, my own desire to, to learn and improve. And from the outside looking in, it, it does look intimidating. It does look like a lot, but from the inside looking out, it's really not that bad, but that was my journey, Drew. It's, um, it's been really fun. It's amazing to share some of these things and have people find value in it and it definitely helps me recall and remember things better. And I think it's for me, an important step in the learning process. I couldn't possibly read all these things just once and expect to make these connections and instill it in me. It's really the process of writing it out that helps me remember everything. 
what's your process for like organizing all that information? Like, I think probably a lot of us took a lot of notes, whether it was high school or college, and maybe we read some books along the way and took some notes or highlighted some sections in those books, but it seems like all that information is scattered. Is this, you know, is this rabbit hole? Is this block? Is that your way of, of organizing? I, I guess a better question would be, what's your kind of process for, for organizing and distilling all that information that it can actually make sense in your head? I had to kind of figure it out as I went through. So I didn't do any of this in college. Um, you know, I was a good student, but I basically just paid attention in class and sort of did the homework. There was no, <laughs> there was no secret process, that's for sure. But for this, most of the books I read are physical. So I take notes, I take highlights. I sort of feel like I'm having a conversation with the author. And then I save it into Evernote, which is this knowledge management tool that sort of everything lives on the cloud. And I basically run my life out of that thing by now. But basically what you see on the website is the, the notes that I've taken, just copy and pasted from Evernote. I remove some personal stuff, but for the most part, that's sort of the, the process. So it's all searchable uh, within Evernote and it's adding tags that sort of helps with some of these interconnections. But this the system is really simple. It's just discipline, right? Like I think the mastery in, in, in most areas, it's not rocket science. It's not that hard to understand, but it's doing it day in, day out. It's kind of the, the Bruce Lee. I don't fear the man who has done 4,000 punches. It's the man who's done one punch 4,000 times. And that to me makes all the sense in the world. It's just the a different way to frame it is taking a simple idea and taking it seriously. And I, I think that's part of this process, part of what's helped me. Yeah. One of my guys, not one of my guys, but one of the guys I listened to Jocko Willick, he, he says discipline equals freedom. And he actually, I think has a book on it, but I think that principle is so critical because people see discipline as just this framework that you live kind of this boring life, but it actually really frees up you in your time to, to do the things that you love to do. And I think, you know, you'd agree with that. I think you'd also agree. And I would say, and I'll go on the record saying that I think Notre Dame is probably one of the best places to get in education and one of the best places to do it in America. But it sounds like you've done so much growing since your time at Notre Dame. And I'm interested in your thoughts on if that's true, like how, what could we do to reform our current like education model to where kids are actually like receiving applicable life skills in organizing these ideas in their minds to where they're not just trying to cram or study and, and get by with a certain grade or GPA because that's what the company wants to see on the resume. How can we actually like create an atmosphere for, for students? Yeah. It's a huge question, Drew, and something I'm it's really a big passionate one. It's about. a big one. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it is. And it's, it's, it's going to be really fun to dig into it, but I can really only speak to my experience and point of view here, but what I didn't get from formal education was a deep understanding of how these ideas and classes and topics would actually help me in the real world, right? So, okay, it, it sounds beautiful on paper, nice theory, but it, it just feels like I'm checking a box, right? I'm taking this class just because it's part of what I had to take to get my my finance under undergraduate degree. And, you know, that's that's fine, I guess, but to me, you're right, right. I feel like I've learned more after college than I did during. And that's probably my fault. That's probably nothing to do with the school. It's just on me. But what <clears throat> keeps driving me, what keeps me so curious is I understand the applicability of these ideas. They're, they're pragmatic. They're practical. Um, they help me in my day-to-day -day life with my relationships, with my family, with work, with investing, whatever it might be. So it's not this just pie in the sky theory that we're learning just for the sake of learning it. There's a direct connection to it, improving my life. And that to me is so important. I get, you know, I might be pragmatically inclined where I'm not a theoretical physicist or anything like that, where it's, it's all about theory and trying to uh, think through things. I really care about the application of it. So for me, Drew, if I was a student again, I would, I would try to instill how these ideas would actually help them in the real world. It's not just for the grade. It's not just for the GPA. Like you said, it's not just for the, their certificate and the status. It's for your life, right? And that's such a different way of approaching it. You wouldn't cram for something if you knew that for the next 60, 70 years, these ideas would be helpful and applicable. And the other thing I guess I would add is, and again, this is probably my fault, but not once in my formal education, did anyone sit down and tell me, 
you know, this is how you really read a book. This is how you distill it. This is how you ask a good question. This is how you learn how to learn. These skills that I think are fundamentally human, nobody ever really sat down to teach me these things. And it sounds it sounds so obvious, right? It's almost like David Foster Wallace's uh, beautiful commencement speech, This is Water. We're surrounded by it every day. So it's so easy to take for granted. But to me, I think whether it's a course done through university or something you do by yourself or with a group of friends, this idea of learning how to learn. And then again, asking a good question, how do you read a book? How do you research, do effective research? These types of things to me are not really touched on in formal education. And I think a, a huge opportunity that we with the lattice work in a small way are trying to accomplish. And I know some other companies and people are trying to um, improve as well. How do you think we convince though, like 20 year old Blas who's saying, I have this mountain of information that I have to consume for this midterm or final exam and, and finance B and, and convince them that, Hey, it's, uh, you know, that, that grade is important to the extent that maybe it can get you a job, but what's more important is that you actually distill that information in your mind and figure out ways that that's going to help you become a better holistic human being. Like, I don't know. Maybe companies are doing this in their interviewing process, but it seems like kids are like, I got to have the best resume. So when I go to the job fair, whenever that is for my school, I stand out relative to other students. Yeah. There's a, a Zen saying, Drew, that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And I don't know if you can convince someone. I think you have to be ready for it. And I wasn't ready until I was 23 and graduated. So I might be 16 or, or younger. So it depends a lot on the person. But again, for me, it's connecting it to something bigger than just a grade. And you're right, like in these schools and these programs, you're so busy that you mentioned taking a step back to get a little space and, and think about things a little bit earlier in this talk. But for me as a student at Notre Dame, I never got that, right? Like it was from tennis to classroom to tennis to, you know, weekend tournament to- uh, there was, Try there was and no get break. some sleep. Yeah, yeah, it's hard, right? And I think that's part of what helped me after school was all of a sudden I had time to just like sit and reflect and think. So that that's for me, Drew, but you know, maybe it's not within the, a university setting, you know, maybe it's something that's in addition to it or after it or before it, but you're right. I think there's, there's so much to do. And it might've been a little bit after your and my time, but I have younger siblings and high school for them was pretty different than it was for me. Like they were worried about SATs as like freshmen and sophomores. And <laughs> maybe I was just ignorant, but I wasn't really thinking about that that young. And there's all these inner, uh, more, uh, you know, different activities they had to do so that the college would look at them. And I at least never felt that pressure. Maybe I was just so heads down with tennis that I, I wasn't aware of it, but we're bombarding kids with more than ever. And it's helpful in some ways, right? It pushes them and teaches them a lot, but I think there's a lot to be said about that space, about taking time to think and see what you really want for yourself. And yeah, it, it's a hard question. It's a, I don't know if I have the answer, but it's, it's worth trying to solve. That's for sure. I love that, that Zen saying, right? The teacher appears when the student is ready. I'm interested like in your daily routine and your life rhythm right now, looking back on uh, maybe even your time in high school, but your, your time as a student athlete at Notre Dame, is there any, like rhythm or routine that you might have tweaked or changed or you're like, ah, I didn't, I didn't give enough time or emphasis to this part of being human. Yeah. Again, in, in school, I had none of this through. So I, I sort of stumbled along after graduation, but I was doing everything I could to just kind of survive. Right. Like I did well in school. I did well in tennis. And those were basically two full-time jobs. I don't think I've ever worked as hard as I did those four years. And I love it. I, I look back on those years with, you know, amazing memories with, you know, a band of brothers where you, where you did some, some pretty amazing things. And I love that, but I didn't have this quick routine and sort of process that I do now. And it's a lot of stumbling and a lot of learnings, but yeah, my, my way of approaching the world and my way to kind of schedule my time was really different in college than it was now, but, or than it is now. But I guess if I, could go back. One thing I would try to try like you, to work do you like somehow. meditate like now and maybe you didn't meditate then, or like, do you have like a practice in the morning, like where you maybe yeah. get up a little bit earlier? It's tough as a student athlete. I mean, I understand it playing football and trying to do engineering. Like 
it's everything you can to like get your stuff that actually you have to turn in to like keep going and have the next day available and then yeah. get enough sleep on like top of it. So these other things are kind of like, they seem leisurely and like luxurious, but they're so yeah. important. And I, I'm just interested maybe if there's like something that it was, is so important to you now that you would have found time as a student athlete to get done. Yeah. Yeah. So now I get up at five ish every day, give or take. Um, and the first two hours of my day are mine. My daughter and wife aren't up yet. Uh, nobody's emailing me, nobody's calling me. So that's when I work out. That's when I meditate. That's when I read and write. And, you know, if you're disciplined with it and you don't waste too much time, two hours every day is, is kind of a lot. It adds up mm -hmm. and there's not too much time throughout my day where I can have that space to be alone and think and write and, um, almost nothing can take away from that time for me. So that's really my, my sacred space. So if, if I had known about that and just what two hours every day in the morning could do to set up my day and help me learn, help me grow. Yeah. I, I wish I had started that earlier. Mm. Do you, for that two hours in the morning, do you wake up and is it kind of just whatever you're feeling for the day? Or do you have any sort of like plan or outline of, Hey, tomorrow morning, I'm going to read as many pages in this book as I can and, and write some notes on it or, Hey, tomorrow I'm going to work out or hey, I'm going to meditate. Like, or is it just kind of you go based on your instinct? Yeah. It gets back to this discipline equals freedom from, from Jocko. So I abide by that in a huge way, Drew. So I kind of have my, my daily and weekly routines and I have tennis, I have yoga, I have all these things that kind of happen once a week and I don't have to think about it. And what it took me a little bit to understand is there's a paradox there with, you know, discipline equals freedom. You would think you can't, you can't have both. But what took me a little bit to understand was if you could structure your life in such a way so that these things that you know are important, your health, your you know, mobility, your flexibility, your diet, your nutrition, time with family, all these things. For me, I sort of look at my calendar and reverse engineer it. So I have my two hours every day in the morning that never gets touched. I have dinner with my family every single night that never gets touched. And then again, tennis, yoga, et cetera, et cetera. And then everything else falls into the blank spaces on my calendar. But, you know, it's sort of like this analogy with the, the teacher and the rocks and the sand and the stone and the water. If you don't fit the big things in, they'll get crowded out. And that took a long time for me to learn. So it's this, it's this concept that, yes, I do have discipline. I do have certain times when I do certain things. But that gives me the freedom in the other buckets to be creative, to not have to worry about what I'm eating or where I'm going to be or what I'm going to do. So that that to me is how so I sort of reconcile the paradox there is without the discipline, I would have no space. Um, I wouldn't have the yeah, I wouldn't have the space for the creativity that I love, that I seek out. So it's yeah, it, I think it's such a good, good way of putting it. I'll never forget the time I heard that that analogy, I think our sports performance, uh, like sports psychologist, uh, doctor was, was up in front of our team and, and kind of had this jar and had these rocks. And she put, I, I think the first time she put the water in and the sand in, and it's like, Oh shoot, there's no room for these big rocks. Maybe for our listeners who don't, uh, haven't heard this, I'll, I'll go into it a little bit, but the idea is you put these, the big rocks, the, the most important things in first, and then you start fitting the sand, the, smaller things by a large chunk, but still significant. And then you put the water in and it kind of just flows. And it's amazing because all of that fits in. But if you were to put the sand in, or if you were to get one thing out of order, all those elements can no longer fit in that jar. And so it's just a, a, a beautiful imagery. And I appreciate you uh, bringing that up. But I wanted to get back to the fact that you've done over 600 book summaries. And I'm interested since you've read so many, is there like a foundational piece of literature or one of those books that you would just recommend to anybody, regardless of the stage of life they're in, that is like, you need to read this, you need to to think about this and see how it applies to your life? I like kind of understanding context and where people are coming from, but there's a, a section, Drew, um, it's called Worth, Worth Rereading. And, you know, there's 600 some books and there's maybe 35 or 40 that fall into this category. So pretty small percentage. Mm. And those are the books that for me, I've read two times or more. So you can sort of think of those as my favorite books, if you will. And some of them are really business oriented. It's, you know, like Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone and 
others are more philosophical, like Jonathan Livingston Siegel or the Four Agreements or something like that. So I, it depends a little bit on sort of the person and the context, but that that list of let's just call it 40 books is my go to if somebody asked me for something valuable, something worth reading. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, a lot of those books are sort of off the beaten path and not the New York Times bestseller. They're just books that resonated with me for whatever reason. Plus, it's a fantastic list. I was going through there and that's where I saw those two books, The Art of Learning and then It's Your Ship. And uh, those two books, I mean, obviously we both know they're they're fantastic, but the list itself, everything's just so well organized and I would encourage all our listeners to go check that out. Another thing I found on there though, was you have these articles and they're, uh, I think honestly I read, it might've been either one of your articles or you do these kind of experiences and maybe you reflect on them in the article but you did a 10 day silent meditation retreat in Nepal. And I thought that was fascinating. And I, maybe like a high level overview. I can't meditate for like 15 or 20 minutes. I'm in the process of, uh, of doing that. Now I listened to a podcast. I think Naval was on uh, Rogan and I was, I was really inspired at the idea of like, I just need to sit down and work through my thoughts. But I think the idea of meditation scares a lot of people because they try it and then it doesn't, they don't succeed because thoughts are coming and it's just like, ah, I've got all these things to do later today and uh, it's just not working for me and I don't have the time to do it and I can't sit still. I'm interested how the heck you did it for 10 days and, and what that experience was like for you. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it gets back to, you said people are afraid of not succeeding and it, it depends on how you define success. Right. And for me, meditation, like a lot of things can be made so complex and so scary, but if you define it as I'm sitting here for some amount of time, just focusing on my breath and noticing my thoughts. If that's how you define it, then you can do it. It might be hard and you might not like it and your body might be in pain, but that's the practice. And what you're really practicing is noticing when your thoughts go astray and then just bringing it back to your breathing. That's that's the essence of it. Now, there's a whole bunch of different schools and philosophies that take that in a whole bunch of different ways. But anyway, the, the actual retreat, Drew, it was incredible. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. And so between, between jobs, I took a couple months off to travel the world and, um, I didn't have a wife or a family yet. And I sort of knew that I was 27 and that would probably happen soon. So what could I do then that probably wouldn't be possible in five, 10 years time and disappearing from the world for 10 days was one of those things. So really in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Nepal, um, 10 day silent meditation retreat. So uh, you're not even supposed to look people in the eyes. It's, uh, you know, no writing, no reading, no speaking. And it's, I think we're up at 4 a.m. You don't talk to, and, you don't talk to anybody. No, no. So you arrive on site and it's just like, uh, they just like hand you the papers and like sign so this. The, you, you arrive one day early and they sort of give you a rundown and show you around. And then when the retreat actually starts, then that's when the, um, the silent, uh, the silent retreat actually starts. Did you abide by the rules and not write? Because you wrote an essay and you detailed each day kind of how you were feeling. And I thought it just resonated with my experiences of trying to like calm myself, meditate, people meditate, prayer, do all these. It resonated with me because I'll sit there and I'm like, ah, oh, my knee hurts or oh, I can't sit crisscross applesauce. And so I was laughing my way <laughs> through reading this, but I'm interested. Did you, did you abide by the rules or were you like secretly in your room at night? Like this is too sick and like writing in your journal. No, I, 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 um, I didn't write anything down during it, but I had four or five days afterwards to, uh, I wasn't traveling. I just sort of took four or five days and that's when I really sat down and try to recall everything I felt on each day. So it's not letter perfect. And I'm sure I mixed up some days, but no, I, I try to do it full out. Wow. So we're, yeah. I'm interested, like what were like some of the high points and low points in that experience? Like People talk about like getting in like this flow state where you just feel so at peace and thoughts are so clear and you just feel this great sense of purpose and connection. And then we've already talked about the lows of money, uh, whatever. What were the, what were some of maybe two or three of those moments for you? Yeah. So I'll never forget this, but the the third day of the retreat was my was my birthday. So I turned 27 during this 10, 10 day retreat. And nobody and told you the, happy birthday. I, yeah. <laughs> you didn't get a happy not, birthday. Not how most people would spend their birthdays, right? Yeah. But uh but Drew, I'll never forget this. It was the the worst of the worst of that whole retreat. My body was dying, my knees were aching. You know, I'm not naturally flexible and 
um, everything hurt and my mind was racing. And, you know, at the end of each session, they sort of ring this gong and that's how you know when it's over. And what felt like 10 hours, they never rang this thing. And I was just so ready to be done with it. And, you know, all these doubts came up and all these things came up and just made it through that day. And the next day, every day after that was just a little bit better, a little bit easier, a little bit smoother. And I think it, it reflects a journey of all sorts, right? Like whether, uh, you know, whether we're talking sports or professional life or relationships, there's always this cycle highs and lows, and it's all about keeping perspective and kind of the, the long-term vision in mind. But yeah, I, I eventually got to some level of clarity where things felt pretty easy and time was flying by and I was able to feel at least like I was able to get to the essence of things and it's just building in time and space to, to give your thoughts and your body and um, all these things are, that are sort of cycling on in your psyche, a chance to get out there and be exposed. And yeah, it felt cathartic in a whole bunch of ways. And uh, like I said, it was still one of the hardest things I've ever done, but um, I don't know yet if I would ever do it again, but I'm really happy I did it that, that one time. I just have a massive appreciation for like the practice of stopping and like just being still. And I feel like it's been a common thread in my life lately. We, we were doing this book at church, um, paralleling one of the teachings and, uh, it was, uh, Mark Comer's, uh, book, the ruthless elimination of hurry. And he was, I think I've talked about it in some of my other podcasts. It was that impactful, but, uh, just this idea of, uh, of putting these stop rhythms in your life. And I think we as Americans would struggle really hard to go to Nepal for 10 days and sit still for whatever reason, it's just built in to our culture. So it probably gives you an appreciation for people around the world who have a better rhythm of, of stop and practice, uh, in their life. I'm, I'm interested. We've talked a little bit about like the mental side of things. Do you do anything to challenge your body like physically, uh, since you've been an athlete or is it kind of like you've really been engaged on this mental side of things? Yeah, no, I mean, long-term, the health and mobility of your body is everything, right? If uh, if I'm not taking care of myself today, 80-year-old Bloss would be really pissed at 30-year-old Bloss. So yeah, mm -hmm. for sure, Drew. So I abide by this kind of minimum effective dose mentality. I don't love working out just for the sake of it. And, um, you know, I, I have a couple of friends who run marathons for fun. That's definitely not me. So like I mentioned, yoga and tennis are a staple uh, every week. And then just do this... 30 minute, really intense lift every week as well. And uh, the book is called Body by Science. And basically there are five major movements and you do those really slowly and you just go until failure. You just do one set and that's it. And I've done that since I graduated. And it's kind of this, you know, this recurring theme through my life that I'm trying to take advantage of, but these small incremental steps, this, you know, ever increasing progress, it, gives you compounding effects at some point. And that's what I love about that workout is I'm challenging my body every week. I get stronger all the time and, you know, it might be just a couple pounds here and there, but you see, you look back over a year and you see how much stronger you've become. So by no means am I putting in the hours that I used to, but what I'm looking for again, it's the, it's the longevity, it's the flexibility, the mobility. Um, I wake up every day feeling refreshed and healthy and good. And that's the, that's what I'm going for. So no longer is it pushing my body to the max to try to get the most of it and play at a, an, a, at an elite level. It's just making sure my body's healthy until I, uh, until I quit until it's time to be out of here. Do you ever take cold showers every day? Yeah. Stop it. No way. Yeah. 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 Dude, uh, I've I been mean, doing cold showers, like not intensely every day, but I do it. So I started, I'm sure we got it from the same guy, but when Wim Hof, I got yeah, onto yeah. him from some guys in the investment office, but he just has this theory that like, uh, I don't know, exposing our body to cold is like really, really good for our overall health. And so yep. I did it for a mental toughness piece. And then also just, I thought it was good for like my skin, uh, acne in college and all these different things. So I started doing it, uh, maybe as a junior or senior at Notre Dame and I've continued to do it since. So I'll do some form of cold water treatment, whether that's surfing or whether that's being in the cold tub or, or showering. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, for sure. I, I did the 10 week Wim Hof thing when I was still in South Bend and go for runs outside and crazy stuff that uh, if I had a wife at the time, she wouldn't let me do. So I was a bachelor doing uh, crazy things like that. But yeah, man, I, I, I definitely abide by it. I sleep better. I feel better. It gives me more energy. So it could all be placebo for all I know, but it's an easy thing to do, right? It's just a, a couple cycles every day in the shower from hot to cold. And there's no downside, right? Worst case, I'm a little bit cold and best case, it helps flush out some of these hormones and kind of pick up my metabolism and some of the other research Wim sort of has pointed us to. But yeah, I, I'm very much a, a Wim Hof uh, bandwagon kind of guy. You're one of his students. That's right. <laughs> I want to get to your, your most recent uh, love, your most recent baby that you've been working on, and that's the lattice work. Uh, fascinating. I had the time to sit down with you and chop it up for 30 minutes the other week about what you guys are doing there. But a little bit of a high overview for our listeners who haven't heard of it. And I think you can find that at uh, ltcwrk.com, lattice work. That's right. That's okay. right. We also have the latticework.com, but just a, a simple, uh, shorter URL is, yeah, exactly like you said. Okay, great. Um, yeah, Drew. So this is a, it's a side project that I'm really passionate about. I think it could become something really special, really valuable, but let's start really high level. So the name, the lattice work comes from Charlie Munger, who um, some of your audience might be familiar with, but he's Warren Buffett's right-hand guy at Berkshire Hathaway, kind of one of the legendary investors of, of all time, I would argue. And he has this idea that to become an effective thinker, you need to be multidisciplinary. And that's sort of a, a scary word in some ways, but all he's saying is you need to have different tools in your mental toolbox. So whether you're an investor or an athlete or um, you know in operations, whatever your field is, that you should look towards other fields, other industries, and understand the key ideas that help them. And that made and makes all the sense in the world to me, right? Just because I'm in aerospace, why would I ignore biology or psychology? If there's a good idea there, I want it. I want to use it. I want to take advantage of it. And this project with the lattice work, what we're trying to do is curate and organize these ideas so that it's a, a one-stop shop, so that you have the resources, these key ideas, these key disciplines in one place. They're explained, they're interconnected. And then the aspect, Drew, that I'm so excited about is the community that we're building around it. So we have people from all over the world. The youngest is 17, the oldest is 87, all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of um, expertise. And it's amazing to get kind of this really diverse group of people together to uh, dive into these various ideas. There's, uh, I think there's 24 big disciplines, correct? Correct. What, uh, I think we might've even talked a little bit about this when we were talking about the rabbit hole and kind of how you distill your ideas, but what's your process for like taking in information and drawing these connections to where you were able to identify these 24 big disciplines and then you have to interconnect all these ideas in this web. What's your process for doing that? <laughs> yeah. So there's nothing elegant You're like, there's like a hundred steps to it. It's, it's a really difficult process. Well, so yeah, yes and no, but honestly, Drew, so the lattice work feels like just the, the next step in the evolution for the rabbit hole. So rabbit hole is sort of siloed individual book summaries. What the lattice work is trying to become is a synthesis, a, an interconnected version that ties all these different patterns and ideas together. But where it all started was I took all my book notes, everything that lives in Evernote, and just put it into a Word document. And it was probably eight or 10,000 pages long. And a little bit every day, I just went through it and saw some patterns emerge. And, you know, I had things like Farnham Street and other resources that sort of gave me a high level overview of, okay, these are probably some of the key ideas from engineering, from physics, from math, whatever. But it was really combing through all those notes and seeing patterns emerge where, um, you know, this book from psychology and this book from biology and this book from investing, they're all kind of saying the same thing. And there's a, a common thread that pieces all of those together. So that was, yeah, it is a, a brute force approach, but it kind of led to the ideas, to the disciplines, to the framework that you can see on the lattice work now. I think this has a lot of like practical implications. One of them that's kind of coming to my head right now is like decision-making. 
And I think it might be because I've been talking with my sister this this week about maybe her the decision she's trying to make coming up in her future as she finishes college here and the, and how she's going to pivot. But I'm interested how maybe some of these principles or uh, connections maybe help like with your decision making like criteria. Are there specific like criteria you use when you're making like decisions, whether it's moving on from a job or uh, choosing whether or not to do the lattice work? Like what is kind of your process and criterion for doing that? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Drew. And one of the key mantras, if you will, for this project is helping people move from theory to practice. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's pretty easy to read a book and get the gist of what the author is saying. To me, what's really hard is then putting that into practice, right? How do I take that idea and apply it to my life, whether it's decision making, like we're talking about now, or investing or habits or routines, right? It's that it's that next step that's really hard. And that's where I hope this project is helpful to people to bring a community around it, to have them keep you accountable, to be soundboards, to have you know people to dig into these ideas together. But decision-making is one of the most interesting aspects of this. And I think it's a really good example of how a lattice work could be helpful in practice. So you know, let's just take three ideas, for example. But there's an idea of, uh, from economics called opportunity cost. And very simply, uh, if I do one thing, it means I can't do anything else, right? Because I have limited Mm -hmm. time, attention, money, resources, whatever it is. So that framework sort of puts everything in perspective, right? Are you doing the highest opportunity cost thing that you can with your time? If not, why not? You know, maybe it's for a good reason where um, if we look just at monetary ways of looking at things, spending time with family is probably not the highest value thing I could be doing from a financial perspective, but in a, an integrated life, spending that time with family is something I'll never regret. So yeah, maybe giving up some money here and there, but in comparison, that doesn't bother me at all. So that's kind of the opportunity cost framework. Another is risk and return, right? Um, uh, One of uh, our key concepts from business and investing. And as we look through the options that we have, trying to understand the variance. What is the absolute best outcome we could have? And what is the absolute worst outcome we can have? What we're looking for are situations, are decisions where the outcome is really high, right? The return is really, really high and the risk is minimal. Now, those are hard to come by, right? But it's not not impossible. So that's one other way to maybe think through it. So, you know, it, it might be helpful Yeah, I think it's a a good real life example of how these various ideas from different disciplines, right? Um, I'm a liberal arts student. Why would I care about economics or business and investing? Mm -hmm. This is exactly why, because these ideas can be applied to your life no matter what. I think investing is a really unique space because it's really like if you boil it down, at least what I like got from the guys in the investment office is it's really about understanding people in how people are moving, how businesses are being developed, and getting down to just understanding the mindset of how humans work. And I'm interested, like on a psychology front, like maybe what you've observed, even in your time as a leader at Glen Eyre, or maybe from other leaders in the organization, like what are some key things that you've learned about how people work and how people operate and how you can best, I don't know, maximize the relationships in your own life? Yeah, there really is no thing as business. Like you said, it's a combination of a lot of different things, which is why I find it so interesting. It's a mix of economics and game theory and, you know, competition and philosophy and psychology. It's all these things coming together, but yeah, from my perspective, Drew, so much of it is people-based. Can you get on with people? Well, do you understand what makes them tick? Do you understand the incentives? Can you follow things through from not just first order effects, but second, third, fourth, um, so all of it comes together and that's where these ideas to me are so exciting. It's, it's real. It's not just an armchair expert. It's working in the real world and they're pragmatic and helpful. So yeah, you know, I, I very much agree and resonate with what you're saying. And, um, something I learned from the, the team at Notre Dame as well is if you can understand the people portion of it, it's, you have a huge leg up and one other interesting idea. And again, kind of stealing from, uh, the chemistry side of the world, but there's this idea there um, called alloying. And basically, if you can take two characteristics that aren't found together, two base metals, 
and combine them in such a way you can get an outcome that is unexpected. It's uh, not one plus one equals two anymore. It's one plus one equals four. Mm -hmm. And as it relates to people, um, you know, you can imagine, all right, Drew, you have incredible technical skills, but you're terrible with people, right? Or the opposite, right? You sort of get the, uh, the jock, the athlete who's amazing at sales, but can't do anything technical. And then the technical person who can't do anything with people. The leaders, the top leaders in the world today have a pretty unique combination of those two things where they're technical and brilliant, but they also have high EQ. And that to me is a really interesting way to try to think about acquiring skills is what are you naturally inclined at? And what is sort of the opposite end of that spectrum? And maybe you can't become world-class at it, but just getting mediocre kind of makes you a, a unique person in the, in the industry, let's say. So would you rather be a seven out of 10 in five categories or a 10 out of 10 in one as a, as a human? It depends. It, it really depends, Drew. Like I love, I, again, sort of, it, I think it's shining through in the lattice work, but I think I'm geared more towards the generalist type approach than a specialist. I think I could spend every waking minute of the day studying any topic and there will still be people who are more brilliant than I am. They're just naturally inclined and I'm not naturally that smart. But I think I could take, you know, these 24 dis different disciplines that we're talking about here, I can be mediocre in all of them, but that's a pretty unique combination. So I'm, I'm banking more on kind of the unique combination of skills than just being world-class at one thing. Fascinating. How do we, if I wanted to uh, become a member or, or get involved with the lattice work, what, what's that process like for me? So you mentioned the URL, it's uh, ltcwrk.com. There's a, a little bit of an introduction, sort of sharing the vision. And then there's a page there that talks about how, um, how you can join us. And we add a, a fair amount of friction on the front end, Drew, and um, it's to self-select for those who are most excited. So we're not looking to become the biggest community or anything like that. We want an engaged, thoughtful, kind, caring community. So if any of these ideas seem interesting to, to you or your audience, I'd uh, love the opportunity to connect and to talk with them. But yeah, this is a, a project I'm really excited about and think it has amazing potential. But when I sign up and join the community, I'm getting this distilled wealth of uh, information and knowledge really that has been put together largely by yourself uh, that you've just thought on for so many years. So I, I mean, I think it's fascinating. I've checked it out and I think all the listeners should too, but uh, Bloss, this has been fabulous. And uh, hopefully we can get you on again sometime in the future, but we certainly appreciate you coming on today, Bloss. We love that, Drew, and I uh, appreciate your time and having me on. It's uh, It's been really fun. So it's uh, thanks for the conversation. Yeah, no doubt, dude. You're a beast, bro. I appreciate you. <laughs> Charlie uh, Munger Jr. You. in the making. 